in terms of um, men's mental health, it's uh, the biggest things really anxiety, depression, um, and I'd say work stress and overwhelm uh, are the main ones. And, uh, and, and suicide risk, actually, uh, particularly middle aged men are the highest risk group for completed suicide. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it's a big part of, of the work. Yeah. Um, and what do you think yeah. that is? Like, honestly, like, why do you think yeah. it's a middle-aged man? Why is it not a, an older man? It, it and seems, why is it not yeah. a younger man? Does that it make it sense? seems to be across the board a little bit, though, because I think, mm. you know, it's probably because there's less things to kill you. But certainly between, I think, even, I think between literally from 5 to 19, it's, it's the biggest killer suicide mm. in, in, in males. Mm. And I think between 20 and 34, it's the biggest killer. Mm. And that's probably because there's not a lot else to kill you at that, those ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that does yeah. show that that men are obviously taking their own lives. Mm. And I think it's, I think men are probably more likely to do that, I think, than women. But I think it's like, well, it's, it's three times more likely, I think men Something are Something like, like that. Yeah. The, the, interesting, well, the interesting facet is that women are more likely to self-harm. So I think they are, they do they behave, behaviors that, that are less perhaps dangerous. Yeah. Whereas men, in terms of completed suicide, they tend to use more lethal methods. So if they overdose, they'll, they'll, they'll do it kind of, they'll go all out yeah. in, in a way that women perhaps won't. So there's yeah. definitely a difference there in terms of, yeah, I think it is that. And I think it's, I think it's just the general pressure that we, we put ourselves yeah. under. Mm. And that's one yeah. thing that I struggle with sometimes is yeah. I always want to do better no matter what it is. Yeah. yeah. I get to a point and I'm happy and I'm like, and then I, I, I look onto the next thing and I think as a, as a, as a man who wants to do better in his life and wants to progress and wants to do lots of different things, mm. you, we kind of tend to put that pressure on ourselves. Yeah. And actually, I think yeah. at times if you do fail at those things, and then I, I think of myself, if I was, you know, in my mid forties and I was nowhere further or even less of where I am now, how I would probably feel because so far I've kind of kept pushing forward mm. and, and mm. keep trying to, you know, progress and do things again. But at time, at, there's going to be times in my life maybe that things go backwards. Mm. And I think when you come to those points, I think that's when you think, oh God, you know, I'm overweight, 45, I've lost half my house, you know, I might mm. be divorced, mm. might be this, I might be that. And then you think, oh God, like, you know, you've come so far and then gone all the way back. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's when, I think that's when a lot of it comes into, you know, mental health, struggle, yeah, suicide. Massively. And I think evolution, in, from evolutionary terms, you know, men, you know, tradition is hunter gatherers. Mm. I think we are very achievement oriented. Mm. And I think we do, we're very hard on ourselves as a result. If we, if we feel like we're in a stage in our lives, in our kind of midlife, where we just haven't quite got to where we want to, yeah. and lots of areas of our life are failing and, and kind of between the ages of say 35 and 45, that is where lots of marriages break down. Mm. Uh, that's where lots of careers come unstuck. You know, financial troubles come in. Yeah. You've got sick parents, you've got the challenges of parenthood yourself as well. You know, so there's lots of things that close in on you and that sense of failure and, and, um, is, is difficult and co that's combined with uh, and i'll just to to kind of allude to what i mentioned earlier the kind of the differences in health seeking behavior between men and women the fact that men don't seek help that as readily and when they do they they, they go too late and when they do seek help, I think men are also less able to open up. They're not able to necessarily share their feelings. I think they're we're much more inclined to bottle things up. We're met, we just kind of get on and cope. There's a real stoicism. And I think certainly my dad yeah. and, and my grandfather's generation were all about just, you just pull your socks up and get on with it. And oh, that is I'm, such I'm a common, even so now, like it's still pervasive, I, I think, today to see that. And that, that really has to change because that is, unfortunately is, is, is not a constructive way to deal with the kind of mental health problems that, that the modern world throws at us. So if those problems do occur to someone, would it, would, what is the best way just to contact your GP? It's a good starting point. Yeah. Because as a GP, I'm able to, I, I can't necessarily solve your problems, but I can signpost you in, in the right in direction. The right direction yeah. uh, and a, a lot of dealing with mental health is, uh, it's, plugging you into the right resources, the right kind of treatments. A lot of that's talking therapies, things like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is one that's been used for years, but there's newer ones, ACT and counseling, and psychodynamic psychotherapy. I mean, the list goes on. So that's really good. Activating your own support networks. So making sure that you're making the most of supportive relationships and fa family and friends that you have around you. Yeah, that Having that, yeah, that, that around you is massively beneficial. Tackling drug and alcohol misuse is a big part of it. 
And the other thing is sometimes it's a role for medication. So we do use a lot of antidepressants and, and they're not, again, a, a panacea. They're not a, a, a magic bullet, but they can give people a bit of a lift and, and just be part of a, a wider range of, of treatments that can get people out of trouble. So I know there's like a big, I don't know if it's a misconception or not, but it, it from my point of view, I've spoken to people that have gone on antidepressants so, and they, they seem to see it as a bit of a weakness of themselves when they've gone on antidepressants. Yeah. Do you find like, do you find that as a, a, a problem to get people on antidepressants or would it, you know, is it better to go and exercise and try and sort their life out or to go, maybe to, to go on antidepressants first? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it, it really depends on individual circumstances. Right. Uh, and you, that's, you do get kind of, I do sometimes hear that from patients, male yeah. patients, particularly this sense of failure. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's what uh, I inadequacy, you know, I, mean, to, to oh, I be, don't need it. I don't need it. You know? Yeah. It, they, I think antidepressants do get a bit of a bad press sometimes. Um, and there's a misconception that they're perhaps addictive drugs, which they're not. Uh, and that, somehow they're 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 failing as a man because they're not fulfilling in their duties they're not strong and they're not mm. masterful and you know, they don't, it, it's kind of this admission that you're somehow weak and not worthy and th that none of that is true uh and addressing some of those i think dysfunctional health beliefs is a key part of treating the illness the underlying depression and that's really where something like cbt comes in that's mm. where it can be really powerful it it it, it, it identifies cogn cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive right? behavioral therapy. it looks at what we call negative automatic thoughts some of these ideas that we that we have that are perhaps untrue but we don't realize that so it it, it shows you that you're kind of self-sabotaging with the way that you approach the world yeah. some of the, the the ideas you have are not serving you and it helps to unp unpack those and reprogram your brain so it's very much in the here and now but it's a it's a very good evidence-based treatment for both depression and anxiety and it's something we use a lot in uh, as gps in primary care yeah, I, interesting. I always think about we always worry about the past and the future, but the present's usually fine. Mm. Where we are right now is usually fine, but we always worry about what's happened mm. or what's going to happen. Mm, yeah. And a lot of the time, we 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 spend so much time worrying about either, yeah. Yeah. And we don't actually appreciate what we're what we're doing right now. Yeah, and I think that's huge. I think it's huge, and I think if people appreciated the present more mm. and stopped worrying about what's going to happen, and, and a lot of the things that they worry about isn't even going to happen yes um, does yeah. that make sense they well, worry about things that yeah. are not even going to happen worrying is just praying for things that you don't want exactly yeah yeah that's it and this is where mindfulness and meditation comes in and this is something i've discovered really in the last since the pandemic really when i was basically spending most every day and every evening indoors mm -hmm. in my own house because yeah. you couldn't go anywhere or do anything yeah. i kind of discovered meditation and um that is a tool to really help you refocus onto the present and it's it's really been beneficial for me actually uh and i don't know if you guys have ever kind of no, played around no, with i've it, never done it a uh, little, little bit of mindfulness yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. interesting you bring it up because i was curious because I, I know certainly i'm not immune to stresses and and feeling yeah. down in the dumps on occasion mm. i'm sure you're not as well will mm. i was going to ask what, what sort of things you tend to do yeah to, to kind of manage your own emotional well-being yeah so like i mean i'm here obviously as a health professional but i'm also some with lived experience of being a 39 year old man in the year 2023 so i am facing all the same stuff and the same pressures and you know i, I get down sometimes the, the, the world just feels like it's overwhelming and i think what we all need and what i've kind of built is a little playbook of things that i know really help lift my mood and 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 get me back on the straight and narrow and um the things that help me in my situation are, are um so we've talked about meditation. I try and meditate for say five to 10 minutes a day. It doesn't always happen, but it's, it's for me, the, the value is I, I kind of, I, I do that after the kids have got, got the kids down just before we have some dinner. It's like a natural window in the day. I'd love to be the person that gets up like 5 a.m. You know, these yeah, kind of yeah. stuff, people. I, I, <laughs> I hate them. A, you know, they always room. talk about I'm up at five and I do my yoga and then I <laughs> yeah. do my meditation and then I drink a, a pint of goji berries or whatever. I don't know. Uh, parenthood doesn't really allow that because I get woken up at like five anyway with like knees and elbows in my face. And, <laughs> and then it's like the curtains are coming down. <laughs> day begins. <laughs> yeah, no, that feeling. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, I've had to kind of adjust that. I, 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 there, that, that is my. It's like with exercise, isn't it? I found a window that enables. It's like a five minute window where I can, I can actually have some kind of quiet alone time. And I just sit there in silence in the garden. There's a nice guy. I'll just look, contemplate that. And it's really just a moment for me to just stop and just pause and just be with my own thoughts. Mm. No screens, no other kind of stimulus coming at me. And then I just focus on my breath. Yeah. 
And it really grounds me and it brings you into the present. And I think the more you practice that, yeah. the more you can then bring that into the day to day. So the moments when you're waiting for a bus, for example, instead of just checking your phone or ruminating over, oh, I've, I've got to organize all this stuff and, you know, little bits, little kind of bittiness of day to day life is crowding your consciousness. Yeah all that background noise, you just take a moment to just sit there, focus on the moment, notice the things around you. You kind of say, oh, it's, we're moving from winter into spring. I see there's, le- there's leaves on the trees and uh, that lady's wearing a yellow dress and whatever. I don't know. You, you're just tuning into the world around you. You're, you're, you're less in your own head and you're more connected and present in the world. And that for me is a massive, massive boost mm. to my well-being. Yeah, my, my experience with that is is not quite to that extreme i guess but it, it, for me i find that if i don't allow myself the ability to to process my thoughts throughout the day i it just disturbs my sleep so much mm, yeah. and i find that when i'm just on the go and i'm meeting yeah, to meeting yeah. client to client you know home, home with the kids yeah, yeah you know cooking maybe get a bit of exercise in like you say on my phone constantly as mm. well i suddenly get down to bed and suddenly that's where my mind goes ah great we got a moment to process and the yeah. thoughts go and I just cannot sleep. Yeah. So I find that if I don't, mm. like it's basically daydreaming. If I don't mm. daydream, allow myself a, mm. a period of time in the day where I'm not on my phone, where I'm not doing anything, it just, yeah, wrecks my sleep. So I need that in order to sleep well. So yeah, I think it's, I think like it that. is really useful.